All right, guys. Uh, so uh, our, our last uh, full-blown class today um, is uh, JB. He's going to be talking about uh, getting your business into the black as quickly as possible. Um, for those of you that did not uh, sit in our uh, annual conference meeting yesterday, um, about 58% of the wineries in Tennessee right now are under 5,000 gallons. Uh, and really, most of those guys are under 1,500 gallons. So uh, for our medium and large size guys, we do know that you start having someone to play with once you get to that 10,000 gallon mark. Uh, so from an industry perspective, I'd like to see as many wineries as possible get into that black as quickly as possible. Uh, so you guys have some room and feel a little more comfortable with your operations. So, JB? Thank you, sir. So what you guys are going to see today is the result of me opening my mouth and Adam said, you know, it'd be really neat. Or I, I looked at it and said, it'd be really neat if we had a class on, you know, growing people from zero to 10,000. He said, really? You, you can do that. And I said, great. great. So we'll see how it goes. Um, this really is meant for someone who is um, never, has not opened a winery yet, starting out, but it does go all the way further to where we're hopefully getting you closer to that 10,000 gallon range. If at any time you have questions, stop me. I'm hoping to leave time at the end for that too, but as we're going through the process, if you have questions, let me know. And we'll take it through. Real quick, the uh, tchotchke, as someone called it in front of you, is just one of our wine club uh, pieces that we give away as a free gift for our wine club. And I'm really glad you talked about wine club, just like you did. How many of you have a winery right now? That's a good question. Okay. How many of you also have a wine club? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand for both, you should. You really need a wine club. All right, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, starting out with, I heard this quote from uh, Mr. Lockwood, I believe, a little while back. It might be very little. You can always live where you farm, but you can't always farm where you live. Right? Yes. So let's talk about basic business planning. So if you're talking about opening a winery, your decisions are you going to be on the farm or off the farm. Well, if you're on the farm, you got to make sure most of the time you are you located farther away from potential customers. You have to make it a destination. If you're going to do it on the farm, it must become a destination in order for you to sell direct to consumers. It's very important. Some examples of that are Arrington Vineyards. That's a self-made destination, right? When they first started, it wasn't really the middle of nowhere, like I said, at the winemaker's dinner, but not all the interstates were coming through, not everything was connected. But with Kix Brooks' influence and the build that they've done at that facility, it has become a destination. Another example is the Apple Barn in Sevierville. That's one of the groups I work with. I work with the Rocky Top Wine Trail in Sevierville County. And the apple farm was already a destination for a variety of reasons. They had a lot of apples on the farm. They made their own uh, fresh pressed cider, they had a candy store, Christmas shop, all kinds of things. So adding a winery in there made sense because it was already a destination. Seven Springs, got a pick on you, Rick. I'm sorry you're here. Rick and Donna, you guys have created uh, diversity because of diversity on the farm and everything you do. And base, I said only rural option. I don't know if only is entirely accurate, but basically you've made yourself a destination in your own market which is really important too. So as was said earlier, when you're consuming, if you're going to be on the farm, people are looking for an experience. They're not looking for your wine, they're not looking for your cider, your milk, your steaks, any of that stuff. If you're going to come back to your farm, it has to be the experience. One of the things I remember about your place, JD, is that truck sitting up front with a tire swing hanging from the tree, and it makes me think that's somewhere I want to go back and take my kids again to watch them swing on that little swing back and forth. So it's important if you think about on the farm. I'm going to go through these first few slides a little quick. So why are corn mazes so popular? Is it because of the corn? It's not, right? Corn maze is popular because it creates that experience of going through it with the kids, with the family. Whether it's a scary one or not, doesn't matter. It is not the corn that brings people to the corn maze. Keep that in mind. So if you're going to go off the farm, consider locating the winery closer to your potential customers. Stonehouse winery. Anyone's familiar with it? That's an interstate location. So it's very easy to get to, very easy to jump on and off the interstate. Uh, pathway with the highways that goes through there, takes you into Nashville as well. Beach Haven Winery, I know they just left. They're right near a military base in Clarksville, right? So large uh, customer base that you're looking at there. Mountain Valley Winery, another group that I work with. Tourism, we're in the Smoky Mountains. The Smoky Mountains see 9 to 12 million visitors annually. So that's an example of if you're off the farm, you need to think about your potential customers and who you can get to. What's important there is you can make wine just about anywhere, but in order to sell it direct to consumer, you have to have what? Consumers. You have to have a market for it. So that is the most important thing to consider if you are in this room and considering opening winery. How many of you have not opened a winery but considering it right now? A few. Okay, good. Oh, quite a few. Excellent. All right. So before you can even get to zero gallons, because we're going from zero to 10,000, right? What do you have to think about? 
State licensing. We are not going to go through all of this. I promise. Do not worry. This is just a small, quick example of all the licensing and paperwork requirements you will need to get a state winery license in the state of Tennessee. Um, and I know it's really small, but that's because you'll be able to view this online later. And there's a website for us. There's websites and links included in a lot of this PowerPoint presentation, so the actual uh, essence of what you need to get to is there as well when you get on the website and find it. And then federal licensing, same thing. A lot of similarities, a lot of differences. But as you can see, there's a lot to getting a winery license. It does take time. So as you're planning on the farm, off the farm, be thinking about the fact you're going to have to go through all of these things too. And there's also a website there. So that uh, ABC, it's all online, must be completed online. TTB, which is the federal licensing, must also be completed online. Both are very similar. In, uh, for Tennessee and the federal systems, they're almost identical. <coughs> Once you become comfortable with them, they are not hard to use. They are very clunky and very challenging at first. But once you get into it, it's not too bad. So things you'll need to know before you sell the first bottle of wine. We're not even at zero yet, really quick. <coughs> if you're making 100% grape or fruit wine, you're going to need to get a certificate of label approval. That's a COLA for short. And what that is, if you're the one bottling the wine, you must receive approval by the federal government for approval of that label to put it on the bottles. And I know a lot of you know this because you're already in the business, which is why we're going to go through it quick. But if you're doing something else, what if you're doing a blended fruit, grape, or flavored wine, or something along those lines, well, you have to also get a formula approved for that as well. So simplified version, if it's 100% grape and fruit, so if it's 100% blackberry, 100% cabernet, you just have to get a certificate of label approval. If you're blending something, so you're taking a Merlot and a blackberry, and you're blending those two together, you must first get a formula, then go back through, and you've still got to get that little bit too for certificate of label approval. Once again, there's a couple of links. And like I said, I'm trying to go through these first pretty quickly. So for simplicity's sake, as we go through some examples, we're going to use this example. Valley Forge, we're opening a winery on the farm. We've planted 10 acres of grapes. Pretty substantial investment there. And we've already received TTB and ABC approval. So you're ready to start selling wine, right? Are we ready? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where's the wine coming from? I looked for a picture that looked like Doug. As much as I can hold so <laughs> oh, uh, He's our wine maker, and he's unfortunately not in the room. Um, but where, where, where's the wine coming from? You've got the grapes planted, right? For those familiar, how many years does it take to get a crop? Three to five years, right? You don't have anything. So what are you going to do? Sit there, twiddle your thumb, and soak someone comes and you know, buy some juice from you? Other processes. Yeah, other processes. So you plant the grapes, but they take three to five years. So what do you do? We're going to talk about that. How do you... Get started as a winery in Tennessee. Now, before we go into all of this, I want to be really clear. Your ultimate goal should be to produce Tennessee wine for Tennessee fruit, which is why you planted the 10 acres. That being said, when you first go to open a winery, you're not going to have wine available. We're going to talk about two options. We're going to talk about sourcing out of state to get you started, and we're going to talk about a better option than sourcing within the state of Tennessee. So we're going to talk about both. So sourcing out of state, any licensed winery can receive an in-bond transfer of bulk wine from other wineries that are also licensed. So what that means is, let's use this example, and I'm going to read it just so it's easy. Valley Forge Winery purchases 500 gallons of finished Pinot Noir from Oregon. Once Valley Forge gets a cola approved for the Pinot Noir label, it can then finish the bottle and then sell the wine through all sales channels. Finish could be filtering, it could be fining, just doing a little bit of manufacturing to the product can get you started for that. The cons for that are upfront costs. Because you've got to have bottling equipment, labeling equipment, um, you have to acquire the colas, you've got to have all the supplies for the bottling, all of that stuff. This is entirely legal, but it should not be your ultimate goal and destination to producing wine in Tennessee. But it is a way to have a product that's, that's similar to what it is you're wanting to accomplish. So I used Pinot Noir because it was just a good example to use. But let's say you are going to be a muscadine vendor and you're going to plant muscadine. It still takes three to five years. You can contract with Post Winery in Arkansas to get muscadine juice or muscadine wine and sell muscadine wine on your vineyard that's not vineyard or winery that's not made from your fruit yet because it's not available, but it gives you that opportunity to gain revenue and get some money in until you have your own fruit to play around with. So option two, did anyone have questions about that first, first one? Okay, good. Option two, in-state custom bottling, better option with a question mark. Now, there's enough of a question mark on it because it might be my opinion, but it might not be others. Any winery in Tennessee can produce wine bottled and labeled for another winery. 
and sell it through that end bond transfer to them. I even cited the law change here. 2017 made that a possibility, along with some, uh, it's the shine law, as they like to call it. So here's a good example. Valley Forge Winery wants to sell Tennessee Niagara wine before their estate vines are fully producing. So they have Niagara planted, right? But they don't have the fruit available yet to make into a wine. So what do they do? They go to Cuckoo Bird Winery, who's you know two, three counties over, to produce bottle and label 500 cases of Valley Forge Niagara. The sale takes place as an inbound transaction, and once that happens, they can sell it out of their winery, just as if it was their own product. Pros, and I didn't put any cons because I couldn't think of any. Valley Forge, there's no hard costs up front. You don't have to have all the machinery and labor and everything else to do bottling. You assume Cuckoo Bird Winery has been in place for a while, right? So they've already got the fixed costs, but they're offsetting that cost through increased outputs by making more wine to help become more profitable there too. And then ultimately, you're talking about Tennessee and Niagara, right? So that also helps the Tennessee grape or small fruit grower, especially if the wine source fruit is grown in Tennessee, which should be the ultimate goal. So I know that's a little confusing for someone who's not in the industry possibly, but basically what we're saying is how do you get some revenue coming in prior to your grapes coming online? These are two really good options for yeah, you. I think it's like a 2B that we're having a little bit of trouble with. So in, in California, they do the alternating proprietorships pretty often. It's pretty common. Yes. And so as I capitalize <coughs> on my on-site winery, I propose to do an alternating proprietorship with somebody that has a, a capacity mm -hmm. for the next two to four years. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, but it seems like the state has kind of stiffed on that a little bit. They won't give me an answer, even though you can show and demonstrate in distilleries, they obviously do it in Tennessee and right. other, other states do it, especially the big wine growing states. How come it's so hard for them to wrap their head around it from a winery standpoint? Honestly, they're unfamiliar with it. So Tennessee, there have been, I don't know of any <coughs> actual alternating premises ever. Well, that, that's exactly why. The feds are familiar with it. An alternating premise is just where you have a property and it's shared by yeah, more than one licensee. Yeah, and you have to move out and move back in. We won't get into that in too detail just yet, but, but there's no, but there's nobody who's done it before. Right, I to talk to. Correct, you know, not, <laughs> not in the state of Tennessee. There's not, so it'll be a slow process. But if you can get your federal approval with that, because you'll have to have a federal as well, the state probably will follow suit. It'll just take some time. But that's a good question. Anything else on this, guys? Any any thoughts? No? You guys are being really cool. Scared me a little bit. So, real quick, grant opportunities. This is really important. Is Kyle in here? Sorry, Kyle, you know I always call you out anytime I have to stand in front. I'm going to go through these real quick. If you're not familiar with these grant opportunities, you absolutely need to be. Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program, it's up to $15,000 that you can receive for a variety of different things to help you on the farm or the winery, including tanks now, if I'm not mistaken, right, Kyle? Winery equipment is how it's described. So yeah. yes, wine, yes, thank you. Winery equipment, so not to get too specific. Ag Enterprise Fund is more so not for the individual producer, but it is. This one's a little bit large, it's 25% cost share. And what you can do with this one is if you're gonna do something that's gonna benefit the region or benefit other people surrounding you, this is a very good opportunity here. And there's uh, an increase in those funds this year in the governor's budget. Um, I'm not gonna get the numbers right, but I believe it's an increase of around $2 million uh, coming into those, so it's available. If you don't apply, there's no opportunity. Not going into these in detail, you should look at them. The applications are online. They're very easy to do, and the Department of Agriculture can and will help you fill out and complete the forms. Um, especially crop block grant. Those are a federal grant up to $50,000, but they are ran through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. Um, just speaking from my experience, um, about six years ago, we received um, a $50,000 grant to set up and run and market the Rocky Top Wine Trail. So there's opportunity for a lot of different things in that category. Um, to consider too. So they're in there so that you can get to them later when you get online. So this is what we're really here to talk about. So I jumped into those kind of quick. How to maximize gallons sold. We're going to be talking about about nine key areas. Online presence, top must do's. Inside the tasting bar, increasing volume by what you do in the tasting room. Shipping in and out of state, which a lot of that was covered in the last presentation. So no, that's perfect. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm really glad you did that. It's better than I could do. Um, remarketing to your best customers, we'll talk about that just a little bit. Wine club, so automate the flow, just like he was talking about in the last presentation. If you do not have a wine club, you really should consider it. Because the group I work with has always looked at the wine club as harvest is coming, right, August through October. We've got to buy a lot of fruit, right? 
So why don't we have a wine club go out just a little before that, have a big influx of cash so that we have the money to then pay for the fruit that we're going to use for the following season. It's a way to ensure that you have consistency in your revenue stream. Wine trails, which I'm a big proponent of, increasing visitation to your winery. We'll talk about that. <coughs> Self-distribution, thinking outside the box. We'll try to explain that, or inside the box, excuse me. We'll get to that in a minute. Satellite facilities, how to double your gallons sold overnight, more or less. And then additional revenue streams to consider. So we're going through those areas. Online presence, top must do's. There are a lot of places that you can put your information online. How many of you have the time to update all of those places? I saw you raise your hand. It wasn't just a scratch your head. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, none of us have time. None of us have time to do all of them. This is just my recommendation on the places that you really, truly do need to ensure that you're on and that you keep updated. Facebook, because it's Facebook. Everybody still uses it. Yelp. How many of you have an iPhone in here? Anyone? If you ever pull up Maps and it pulls up a business, that business is being referenced from Yelp. So the maps on the iPhone pull from Yelp. So if you're not on Yelp, you're not on the maps, for Apple, at least anyway. Google, very important. All of these links are where you can claim your business is listed. So you don't have to worry about it being incorrect or someone providing misinformation. These links will allow you to actually gain access and change the data and the information on each of these individual pieces. TripAdvisor, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but at least in our market, if we as a winery, if Mountain Valley is in the top 10, I can see between a 5 to 10% 5 increase in sales just because we're on the front page of TripAdvisor. So when we drop down, that instantly goes away. So it's something really to think about <coughs> on that too. Tennessee Vacation, if you're not familiar with it, just briefly, the state provides free partner pages to any business in the state of Tennessee, including wineries, vineyards, farms. TNVacation.com, that's probably my fifth largest producer of website traffic to our websites and it's free and you can make it look really nice so be, be sure you have one of those if you do not have one they're super super important and then finally just a quick plug tfwa if you are a winery or a vineyard tennesseewines.com slash membership you do have to join to get a listing on there but all the information is there and adam can talk to you about that later if you guys have any questions about it too but I can't overstress just keeping this simple stuff up here updated and having control over your own business makes it a whole lot easier. A whole lot easier. And they're all free, 100%. Yeah. No cost for any of that marketing right there. So if you put this on there and you take care of an update, it, it doesn't cost you a dime. It's free marketing and advertising and consistency with your website. So increasing volume through the uh, through sales of the tasting bar. How many of you charge for wine tastings right now? Show of hands. Great, how many don't? All right, that's interesting. Three years ago, it was the exact opposite. So three years ago, we had one person raise their hand to charge for tasting and everyone else in the room kept their hands down. And I have a feeling we know, I know why you guys do that. We'll talk about it in a second. So you need to think about a few things if you're gonna switch over to charge for tastings, but it is a good concept and something to consider. High versus low customer traffic. If you're really high traffic like we are in Gatlinburg or in downtown Nashville, charging for tastings a lot of times will get the can kickers out of the way, right? So you're not wasting all the time with all those tastings, free tastings that aren't going to result in a sale. Um, for low customer traffic, it gives you the opportunity to give something nice for like a wine club membership or something. Hey, you know, we're not too busy. Come in. You can talk about the wine club. Maybe you can waive their tasting fee with that too. So things to consider with high and low customer traffic. Um, an example, premium tastings at Mountain Valley Winery. I have yet to be able to convince uh, the owners and Don to charge for all of our tastings at the, on the wineries yet. So well, how we compromise is we have about 8 to 10 wines on our wine list. I feel like that's kind of standard. Some people go as high as 16. Some are a little bit lower than that. But we have about 8 to 10, up to 12. What we do is we do four free samples for free, and then we charge $5 for four more samples. And so if you think about it, if you're pouring an ounce sample, that's just four more ounces, you're getting $5, right? You'd be surprised how many people will pay that additional $5 to taste the additional premiums. And I have a feeling you haven't went to charge for tastings yet because you like giving that to customers to free because it obligates them to purchase, right? I'm still doing that with the free tasting. So with that type of model, it's a good segue into charging for tastings if you're uncomfortable with it. So think about it and consider it. But 
charging for tastings is definitely a revenue generator and also something that you can utilize to um, eventually give to special customers as well. And it seems like it's become a more common practice now as well. Yes. Before, three years ago, as you make the comment, we were all flip-flopped. But it wasn't the common practice. Correct. So, yeah, about three years ago, people weren't accustomed to Tennessee wineries charging. But when we received customers from North Carolina or California or New York, first thing they did was pull out their wallet and put $5 on the table. And I'm like, oh, that's a thank you for the tip. I haven't even served you yet. Um, but, uh, no, they were doing it because they're so accustomed to charging, being you know, charged for tasting. So now that it has become common practice... It's, it's not been as big of a concern. Offer wine by the glass. Um, how many people do wine freezers or spice mold wine in the winter time? I mean, you guys know what that does for revenue. If you have a wine that's not selling quite so well and you need to help move it a little, mix it in with some wine freezer or a spice wine, and it really makes a big difference. I'm not going to tell you what Doug calls that. Some of you know, and I'm not going to tell you. So for um, wine level people, do you have to have a fruit uh, uh, recipe for those big drinks when you serve them by the glass? No, you don't. But you do have to pay liquor by the drink currently in the state of Tennessee if you mix them. It was just wine and... It, wine and anything, and it's a mixed drink, yeah. So good to answer that question. If you just serve... Well, and even wine by the glass, you still have to pay liquor by the drink. Now, currently, in the state of Tennessee, TFWA, Rhonda and JD, and those who are in here, we're running a bill to try to make uh, mirror the distilleries where we are not required to pay liquor by the drink, 15% on the products that we produce at the winery and then sell by the glass. We feel like we have a decent chance of getting that, but there's no guarantee. So as of right now, you have to get a uh, Tennessee Department of Revenue number and pay 15% on the sales of any wine by the glass, whether it's mixed or not. So that's a good question. But you don't have to have a private drink license. You know, you don't. It's, you just have to have a tax account. And that's, we won't get into those details. That's the reason they never charged us for it, because the Department of Revenue didn't know how to. Now they know how to, they just give you a number, it's not a license, because your Tennessee winery license legally allows you to serve wine by the glass for what you produce. But you have to get a separate uh, tax identifier code for, from the Department of Revenue so you can pay that particular uh, tax. But yes, you don't have to have a separate license. That's correct. Limited food service, I know that Nikki's having good uh, experience with pizza, right? Yes. In the bakery? Sure. Yeah. So the idea there is you're you're doing two things. One, if people are there to consume for long periods of time, like Rhonda's new beer place, you have food that you can provide to them to help compensate for that consumption, plus also it's additional revenue. And the longer people stick around, what are they gonna do? They're gonna enjoy themselves more, they're gonna have a better experience, and I've found that when you have a good experience, you buy wine and you take it home. So offering food is a really good idea. We don't do it in my group, it's just a little challenging for us, but um, it's something to consider. Level pricing discounts, um, something else to consider too. Three bottles, six bottles, 12 bottles. Reason for that is it gives you something to kind of push that customer up to the next level. They've got two bottles of blackberry sitting there and you say, you know, I'm really glad you like the blackberry, but didn't you like the raspberry too? Well, if you get one more bottle, it'll bring you up. And what we're talking about isn't, it is revenue, but we're talking about gallons sold. So I'm gonna show you guys some math on that in a minute. But increasing the gallons you sold is the ultimate ultimate plan here. Um, incentives to employees, always directly tied to revenue and profit. So one good example of that is uh, club signups. Uh, we have, and we'll talk about club later, we have a monthly three-pack club that we do in our wine group, and there's a $10 sign-up fee to join because we give free shipping to that three-bottle club shipment. We give that $10 directly to the individual who signed up that club shipment. We never did that before. We've been in business since 91, never done. We started last year. We have 893 pack club members now because the team is so ecstatic and excited about getting that extra $10 that it has generated that, that energy you need to get the signups. Uh, email collection, we sometimes incentivize for email collection because that's also really important. And um, Monthly, weekly revenue. I don't know. I know a lot of you probably have monthly sales goals or yearly sales goals. Sometimes breaking those down into a week makes a lot of sense too. Giving your staff a goal for a week really can get them focused enough to get those retail sales up and make a huge difference. So just think about timing on that, changing it up sometimes, and improving the experience. Um, the gentleman I work for, Don Collar, is a big 
proponent and fan of offering winery tours because if you see it being made, if you see the tanks, if you see the integrity of the location, guess what? People are going to tie a lot more into your brand and they will pay more for the products because they understand the quality and the, and the craftsmanship that goes into it. Um, you can also educate people, improving the experience. We're people looking for experience through food and wine pairings. One of the easiest ones to do is lemon and honey. And it's cheap, and it's easy, and it's convenient. Just have some lemons cut up, have a bottle of honey with some throwaway spoons, and every now and then just pull them out and do it with a standard tasting. You can charge for it as well, but I've found that just offering that periodically to someone who's new to wine or is just trying to get a feel for it, you'll have an ambassador for the rest of their lives. They'll come back every year, they'll buy more wine from you, and then they're going to use your wine to teach their friends how to do the lemon and honey thing back home. And for those that haven't done it, try it sometime. Lemon and honey with the same wine, you'll be really surprised. It's, it's super cool what it does. It's acidity and sugar is what it does. So let's use an example. 150, please bear with me on the math. I apologize. I know math causes a lot of people to blank, but I'm going to try. 150 weekend customers examples. So here's the difference in charging for tastings and not charging for tastings. Example one, the average bottle price is $18. On average sale is two and a half bottles. Customer conversion rate is 50%. So that means out of that 150, 75 will purchase. And it's three samples. Everyone tastes for free. Everyone tastes for free when they come in. So 150 people visit. 75 purchased the average two and a half bottles of $45, right? So that's 3,375 and roughly 188 bottles of wine that you're gonna, you're gonna sell that weekend with 150 customers. So you've sold 38 gallons and you've made about $3,300 worth of revenue. That'll stay up there for a minute. So if I lost you, I'm gonna go through it one more time. 150 people, we know that on average 50% of the people, five out of every 10 that walk in the store buy, so 75 people purchase. I know my average transaction amount is 45, and that's how I came up with that math. And it'll stay up there for a minute because we can do example two. So the only difference here is I'm gonna charge $5 to sample, which I know through our experience that 85% of the people pay to taste, okay? But I'm also going to offer that $5 back on the purchase of six bottles or more. Okay? So I'm charging them to taste, but I'm also saying, hey, if you buy six bottles, I'll give you a $5 discount on that, on that purchase, right? So 150 people visit, 85% pay the sample. So that's 128. I just made $640 that I didn't make up here. 50 people purchase, which is um, a little less, right? So the average transaction at 45 brings me up to 125 bottles in this revenue. But 15 of those people, so the 75 is still there, right? But 15 of them upgraded to the six bottles because I gave them the $5 back from the charge for tastings. So this math equates out to 42 gallons and $4,400. So what you've just done is just in this example, by charging for tasting and offering it, and this works, this isn't just me making it up. We, we do this at the wine all the time. I've increased my gallon sold by 10% on one weekend just by charging for tasting and offering the, the, the money back on a, a substantial purchase, more than two bottles, because that's my average. So I know that's a bit of math, but does anyone have any comments on that or questions or thoughts? Why'd you drop from 75 to 50 purchases? Well, no, 75 still purchased, but 15 of them upgraded. I got 15 of them to upgrade. What did I do wrong? No, no, just a comment. So uh, there's some other studies that I've seen that instead of giving that $5 back, give them a tchotchke. Well, there's a reason I brought the little things for you guys today. So yes, tchotchke is also an option. You can keep the $5, but say if you buy six bottles, I'll give you this pop socket. Take it home or corkscrew or whatever it is. And we'll have, I'll have some links in here where you can buy that for those items as well in a minute. But that's a good point. You can keep the revenue. How many of you keep the revenue? <coughs> the charge. Majority, how many of you get it back? Okay, a little bit of both. And you had a question, Bill? Yeah, where do you get 150 people at? <laughs> <laughs> you ready to you ready to find out? I'm not, I'm not in Gatlinburg. I know you're not. I know you're not. This this math though works for any number of people. It could be 10, it could be 20. It's still a 10% increase in gallons sold. So, I just had to make the numbers look bigger, else I'm showing you a $30 increase. You're saying, well, why the heck would I, I do like that? I the bottom numbers. Do you? Yeah. Well, if you like that, you should charge for tasting. Yeah. <laughs>
All right. But the the, the cool thing is Christiana doing this. Come on. Yeah, how's the other spot doing? You're a little busier there. How many? You're getting 150 customers there on a weekend. <laughs> Sometimes that's. But there's the answer, right? You got to strike while the iron's hot. So if you can get more revenue when you have the people, that's that's the key. That's question, the key. Question for you. Yeah. Obviously, you got people that come back even to our facility, and they'll come back and do it. It's amazing to me that people will come up. We obviously give a glass. Yeah. With our taste. Okay. So you can technically look at your sample for free and charge them for a glass. I mean, no. however you want to look at it, but that's, I mean, that's basically what you're doing. Yeah. But the, I think the cool part about it is to take it and do it where you're not doing the same thing all the time. Where sometimes maybe you keep the $5. Mm -hmm. now, some months you maybe keep the $5, some months you give the pop socket, some months you give a pen, some months you don't give anything change and change it up and see because. What we have found out is the people that, it, it is kind of interesting to me, that the people that come, they get new people in town and they come back and they taste again as well just to get another glass. Yep. It is, I mean, you think, how many glasses do you need at home? Oh, but, wait, wait until we get to the wine store, right. because people will do anything for wine glass. So yeah. I think maybe changing it up is a... Changing it up, that's, that's an excellent idea. It really is. Because so, if that person comes back... So when they were here the first quarter or the whatever, mm -hmm. they come back and you're doing something different. So, gosh, then we need to go back because what are they going to do different next time? Correct, exactly. And back to your point, that wasn't to show how to get 150 people. That's just to show you're getting customers. How do you get the most out of them? We'll talk a little bit about how to get the customers too, but primarily it's increasing those gallons with what you are have coming in. So this was covered really well in the last session, so we'll go through just a little bit. But shipping in and out of state, in the state of Tennessee, to directly ship to customers. Customers. You must be a licensed winery and renew the license every 12, uh, 12 months. You pay the excise and sale, I missed an S there, sales tax, um, paid exactly the same way. Labeling is important, we talked about that, must say 21 and up, verifiable ID, so on and so forth. But we'll go into those details, because you can find it all right here. You must also contract with a common carrier, FedEx or UPS. Um, out of state, each state varies in its requirements substantially. And I know that because I personally do reporting for 12 states. So Vino Shipper is amazing, and you guys should absolutely do that if you're considering shipping. Um, it may be worth your time and energy for some of the surrounding states, though, because there's a lot of revenue to be had in surrounding states. Georgia, Florida, Ohio, South Carolina, North Carolina. That's the majority of our tourists are coming from. So do look into it. You can't ship into Alabama, and as of the moment, it's very difficult to ship into Kentucky, even though it is legal. It is difficult to get the license, and none of the common carriers are currently doing that. I speak just UPS now. Oh my gosh, I was gonna ask you that question. So UPS now does ship to Kentucky? license to go to Kentucky. That is fantastic. Um, there is a way to get a Kentucky shipping license now. And if you are in Tennessee and you're a winery you ship, you need a Kentucky shipping license. There's a lot of customers coming from Kentucky. A lot. That's great. That's fantastic. So, if you want to make it super easy to start, you talk to that guy. And you really should. Because it is easy. And what I mean by that is you go in, you set things up, you uh, set everything up on the system, and then you sell it and you fulfill the shipments. And that's about it. They take care of all the reporting and handling and all that type of stuff. Now, as I said, don't get mad at me if I got your percentage wrong. I said I think they get like an 8%. I don't know if that's quite accurate and that might be negotiable. But the point is, if you guys utilize Vino Shipper, um, they'll handle a lot of your reporting, sales, and excise tax. That takes me an entire week out of every month myself just to do that because it takes time. We ship a lot. Um, these two links, VinoShipper.com, take you straight to it. And then this one, if it, I, I, may, I stepped out of the room a little bit, but TennesseeWines.com has a specific Tennessee Vino Shipper section. So if you ship in Tennessee and you are a Vino shipper, you are in that Tennessee section of the um, site. And so you're going to get in front of customers who have been going on there for, and Brian's not in here, so I can pick on Keg Springs has been with Vino shippers for quite some time. But now customers going online there will also see your product as well if you're a Tennessee winery. So we're not on there yet, but we're going to be on there too. It, it yeah. also lets the customer buy three bottles from Brian, three bottles from JB, three bottles from JD, and they can have, it comes from different sources, but they can shop their favorite Tennessee wine. Before. And it's one transaction. So it saves a lot of time and energy for the customer. Any questions about any of that? Just a good good thing to consider. Um, <coughs> and club, we'll get into standard shipping. I'm, I'm not going to get to go into numbers, but I just need you to know there's a lot of customers that want wine shipped directly to them. So there's 
good potential for revenue there if you're not doing it. Remarketing your best customers. I only have one word for that right now, and that's emails. Emails, 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 emails. If you're not collecting emails from guests coming in your winery, you need to start to mark. And there are plenty of applications that can do so. You can hand write them if you have customers, hand write them and then put them in yourself, which we have to do in some cases. Um, emailing your best customers is one surefire way to increase revenue and gallons sold. It just is. And so going into that, uh, use an email service like Constant Contact, MailChimp, or Emma, or My Emma. Aside from regular monthly updates, you can occasionally email them when it's the right time. So I'm going to give you an exact, uh, actual real world example on the Cyber Monday sale that a group recently did. Their email list is 41,000. That's pretty good. That's really good. That's good email. They have, though their open rate is 17% of those people are going to open the email. They also know that that link to the shopping cart can get a 10% click through rate, right? So we had 753 people click the link to the shopping cart. We had 128 sales. Most of those were cases. Revenue generated $25,000 from one email. One email. Now it took a long time to build the email list to 41,000 people. A long time. But a really long time. But if you do that and you use it and you don't overdo it, the discounting, like you mentioned earlier, it's, it is really an excellent opportunity to make some revenue from shipping. It really can happen. That, that's a real, real example. And gallons sold by that email, 300 gallons, since we're talking gallons. So we have a 10% increase from the previous thing. That one email just sold 300 gallons in one day. One day. Wine club, automate the flow. How does a wine club work? Most of you know how wine clubs work, but basically it's a special thing that customers get into. They receive special incentives, discounts, other things. They're kind of like your brand ambassador, your best customer. That's what they are. You need to treat them like they're your best friends, because they will be from a winery perspective. And what makes the best wine club? I, I found that quote really good, and I'll let you guys glance at it and read it if you want to. Um, but I'm telling you what, you hit the nail on the head. Wine clubs are really the way to do it, to get consistent revenue. Since we can't trust to get 150 customers every weekend. But you know if you've got 200 wine club members that come January, you're gonna charge them, you're gonna charge 200 people for club and push it out. It's, it's almost guaranteed income if you have it set up. Two places I would recommend to consider, aside from you know, Shipper, since it's on there, is Wine Direct for a wine club solution system if you're gonna grow and activate commerce, we utilize them. They're pretty good as well. Their shopping cart's a little bit clunky. It's the only reason I don't enjoy them. It's just not the best in the world. But here's a couple of examples of uh, the Rocky Tops uh, clubs. We have a total of three I'm gonna show you. This one's the more traditional. It's a winemaker select. It's six bottles twice a year, and there's no sign-up fee. It's $99.99 per shipment. And they get exclusive wines. We make a, a new wine every six months for this club, specifically for them. And they're the only ones that get it for 30 days after shipment. So simply put, this is the exclusive type wine club. It's an exclusive type. They also get other discounts and things, and that is the traditional side. We get 20% off gifts and 15% off in store. But as the previous presenter said, don't over discount. And we've had to be really careful with that. We've been rolling some of that back for a while, but it has worked for us. Go. Is it stuck? No, there we go. Quarterly case club and the monthly three pack I already mentioned. This one, we have a lot less people in it because they get a case, 12 bottles, four times a year. There's no sign up fees. Price varies based upon what they picked. We give a very deep discount. It's almost like a wholesale discount to get it to them for bulk. But if you think about it, put 100 people in that club and how many cases do you sell in a year? That's 100 people. Every four times a year, that's 400 cases of wine from 100 people in that club. And this monthly three pack, we started that recently because we found that people want convenience, right? What does everyone ask? Can you ship that to me for free? Amazon, free shipping. That three bottles, we don't discount that at all. It is 100% retail price of the wine. If it's a $30 bottle, that's what they pay. If it's a $12 bottle, that's what they pay. So we, it's a discount, but it's in the form of free shipping, which appears to be convenience to the customer. Which, is, which really excites them. They don't look so much at the cost. They're worried about the shipping expense. And that one's been very successful for us. Um, something to consider. So just real quick, on all three of those, mm -hmm. they can select mm -hmm. what wines they want, except for the one where they get the two winemakers. Right. So we used to have only the winemakers select, and we didn't let them select anything. We picked it all. That is the quickest death you'll ever have in a, wine, a successfully growing wine club. 
you want to allow the customers to select their options. It's a really difficult thing to do at first, and you're going to feel really uncomfortable right off the bat. But once you do it, and you see the additional people coming in, it's really good. So yeah, all of those, they get to pick whatever they'd like. Except for the wine maker select, they get to pick, of the six bottles, they get to pick four. We give them two of the specialty wine that we make. But they do get to select those other products. So is the wine club really worth it? You did this math already, but I'm going to show it one more time just to help it sink in. Quarterly case club, I've got 12 bottles four times a year. There's that 100 members that we've had signed up, and that took a long time. Gallons sold each quarter, 230 gallons per quarter. That's almost 1,000 gallons I'm selling a year just to the wine club. And it's automatic. You just call them, you just put, push the button, it charges them, you ship it out, and you make the money. So a club, it's not is it worth it, it's why aren't you doing it yet? You need it, you really need to do it if you're not. Um, revenue. Just as an example, and this isn't a real world, it's just an example, but let's say it was $12 per bottle, right, which is pretty low. $144 a case, $14,400 a quarter, that's $58,000 a year from a 100-person wine club in a quarterly club. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money you can generate from a wine club, and that's just one. And 100 members, divide that in half. You've only got 50. That's still $26,000. It's a lot of money and a lot of a lot of gallons is what I really want to point out. Nearly a thousand gallons in just one wine club. Any questions about the math? Anything? How are you doing to let them choose their wines that they feed? You is have to have a, you have to have a club system that allows for them to log in and, and hand select, which is why those two examples were given. You want to give them a membership login that allows them to do it. You don't want to be responsible for updating their club shipments because A, you'll get it wrong. B, they'll forget what they told you, and therefore it's still your fault and you got it wrong. Um, or you don't have the time to update them all. So you want to let the customer update their club. Yeah, that's a good question. So wine, wine trails, increasing visitation to your location. A wine trail is basically just a joint marketing effort. That's all it is. It's a group of wineries working together to share customers. So this is one of those ways you get that 150 customers on the weekend, right? You give away glasses, gifts, things like that. So one example of that trail is the Rocky Top Wine Trail. After the third stop, you get a free wine glass on this trail. And after the final stop, you get another free gift. And what we found is as you add more wineries to a wine trail, you kind of have to add that additional giveaway of some kind to get the traffic to go. Because if in a, if in a year we get 40,000 people to do this trail, now we're in a very highly trafficked area, we'll get 40,000 people to go here. Previously, until we made some changes, only 15% were going to all five. But what we did is we increased the gift, made it nicer, and we reduced the distance between them because we dropped the one that was really far away up in Gatlinburg. And now we're up to a 45% conversion. So we're going from, we went from 15% going to here, the total at three to 45. So if you're having trouble with a wine trail and you're on one, you need to really think about the distance between the properties and you need to think about the value you're providing to those guests who are going on the trail. And people will, I've got people that want to do the trail every day just to get the wine glass and take it home. So talking about a wine glass, JD, people will do it every single day if they have an opportunity to do so. So that's distant. You've got four months. Hmm? You've got four months worth of data looking at the impact of shortening the distance. You mean the change for Gatlinburg? You know, when we did Gatlinburg? Yeah, yes, we have about four months of that. It didn't really impact much because customers were still, so we've had the Rocky Top Wine Trail in place for 10 years. We started a new wine trail called the Gatlinburg Wine Trail. We took one property off, added it to it, and we have other partners on that trail. The first few months, customers didn't know, so it didn't really, the, the you know, trend stayed the same. But beginning in December and January, we saw a very large uptick in completion of the Rocky Top Wine Trail due to the fact that it was condensed. So yeah, I've, got about, I've got about two months of good data for that. Kind of distance we're looking at between these wineries. Um, so driving is more so than time because if it's a rod run, hours. But you know, if you're talking distance, um, those wineries on the Rock of the Wine Trail, there's about a mile to two miles between each of them, give or take. A mile or two miles between, between each. each. Yeah, but if you're if you're ten miles or less, I mean, it does not take long to drive ten miles. So I think Amber Falls, Amber Falls is probably as close as anybody. Pickers Creek. I mean, we're we're forty miles apart. 
Right. So you might not, you wouldn't be able to do a wine trail at this present time, but if other wineries open up closer to you. That is the closest to me. Well, now it is. <laughs> now it is. Yeah, right now, until you put another satellite beside yourself with a different brand, and you got two. I'm going to be cutting my own throat. I know it's not all on the table. Yeah. Would you mind talking about Little Bear real quick and just how that changing the brand of a satellite kind of allowed you to. I'll be, and I know I'm running out of time. I'm trying to go through it fast. I'm sorry. I'm, in, I'm going to get to satellites. That's why I, I thought it would be a good thing for Billy because if he looks at another satellite location, it's a brand new yes. name. So remind me about that when we get to satellites, and I will talk about it. So real quick on the Gatlinburg wine trail, it's a lot of information. It's really tiny. I'm sorry. I couldn't fix that. But this is how we track data on the wine trails. We keep up with exactly how many third stop glasses were handed out, 2,300 in the month of January. By the way, that's crazy for, for, for our town. That's insane. Um, we handed out 7,300 passports, so we know how many people actually visited the wineries, too, because the goal is to hand a passport to every customer, right? And then the final stop gift is a mug. We only had 623 complete. This data is not perfect. It's a brand new trail. We've had to trade glasses and stuff because we ran out of things and we weren't prepared. You'll live through all of that, I promise you. But um, the point is track your data on the wine trail because you will eventually have a meeting with all of your partners, and they say, why am I doing this? And if you have nothing to show them, they will quit. But if I can show them this, I wish Cades Cove was here. Cades Cove, these two properties here, they saw 127 people here, and they saw about another 250 right there. <coughs> How many people is that, Billy? It's more than 150 <laughs> in a week. So point is, point is, wine trails are great. And I think I forgot a wine trail on here. I'm really sorry I ran out of space. We've got Gatlinburg. These are ones that exist. Rocky Top, Upper Cumberland, Natchez Trace, West Tennessee Wine Trail. I forgot one, I think. If I did, I'm sorry. But point is, if you go online and get this later, you can click these links and see what the wine trails are doing. So if you decide to create one yourself or try to join one or should make some changes to yours, you can check that out. Wine trail impact on gallons sold and revenue. Real world example for January 2020. We had 2,300 people visit the third stop, right? Give or take. We found that about 30 to 50% of the wine trail customers purchase, right? It's less. It's less. They don't buy as much as your regular customer because they're going to a lot of wineries, right? But they still buy. And the average transaction is only two bottles here at $17 a bottle. So if you calculate that out, that's 2,300 people came through. I'm going to use the low end of 30%. Only 690 people purchased. Multiply that by 30, 34, though, and that's $23,000 that was added to the stream of revenue for that wine trail between all the properties. That's pretty impressive if you think about it. That's a one-month impact, 30 days. That's between, for one location, and that's one location example, mind you, right here. That's 275 to 350 gallons sold. <coughs> 15000 to $30,000 worth of revenue generated. Now, all of this depends on your own bottle price, your average transaction amount, your conversion rate. Not everyone has these conversion rates, not everyone has these bottle prices, okay? Some people that I know in the business convert 80% of their traffic to sales. So if you're that number, imagine what this would do for you. Um, examples real quick, glass supplier, I would recommend Arton Products. They're a member of TFWA. You get a two-tier discount on their pricing if you're a member of TFWA to purchase glass. And inexpensive gift supplier, yes, it is out of the country. For imprint, most of it's going to come from overseas, but we were able to get those coffee mugs that retail at $22 a piece for uh, $2.05 a piece. So when you're talking about expenses for wine trails, which we're not talking about, you want to get the price down per unit because it gets really expensive really quick. But the money's there. It generates the revenue. According to the discussion I've had with the members of the Gatlinburg Wine Trail, since it's been implemented, a 15% increase in total revenue for each property, not just one. So all do, you own, do you own all the, the wineries on that trail? No, okay. no. No, we operate two of them, um, and we, um, am I doing that right? Yeah, we operate two. We have no involvement with the other, and we work closely with Kate's Cove, but we know that we don't care if y'all are under one organization to make everybody play by the same rules. Oh, it's, it's, to. that, I'm, yeah, that's the challenge. Um, even having the great partnership that we have with Kate's Cove and Bootleggers, it's still been a challenge. It just always will be. But if you can get everyone on the same page, and I have a training packet on Wine Trust if anyone wants it. Um, it's phenomenal what you can do. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Wine trails are one of the best things in the world you could ever do, aside from a wine club. Now, self-distribution. 
To explain that, any winery in the state of Tennessee can self-distribute 3,000 cases of wine they manufacture um, within 100 miles of their premise to any, if they don't have a contract with a wholesaler, sorry, let me caveat that, to any restaurant, hotel, anyone like that who holds a liquor by the drink or wine license. You can't distribute to a grocery store. You cannot distribute to a liquor store. But what you want to think about with this is a little unique. And there's the publication, actually, that dictates that law. So if you get this, that takes you to the law that allows you to do this. You can read it, see what it means. Recommendation. Do not try to sell to 5 million different restaurants and sell a case to each of them every week. What you really want to do is try to find a partner. You want to try to find a partner. And I actually called, a, uh, called up two restaurants in town and said, how many, wine bottles, how many bottles of wine do you sell in a month? And so standard, standard restaurant, not fine dining, sold 60 bottles of wine in a month. They don't sell a lot of wine there. But still, that's 744 bottles annually, right? A fine, fine dining restaurant sold 2,460 bottles annually, right? So what you want to do is you need to work out a deal with a very small number of, of hotels and restaurants and become their house wine, become the wine they sell. It does two things for you. It gives you prestige. It also increases your revenue without having to drive to 15 restaurants, right? So you want to create those relationships, and it makes a big difference. Because using those numbers, if you assumed you worked out a deal with two standard dining and one fine dining, that's 782 gallons annually. So what I'm trying to show you is, is by piecing all of these different things we're talking about together, you, I just, we've done 1,000 gallons here, 1,000 gallons here, 1,000 gallons here, 1,000 gallons here. If you do it all, you can get to 10,000 gallons. There's a way to do it. There's a pathway. So the other interesting thing about self-distribution is you get to keep the, what would traditionally be the wholesaler share, right? That 30% markup. You can either keep it yourself, you can share it with the retailer who's selling your product, or you can not give them any discount at all and they'll just sell it like they normally would at the 30% rate, that's up to you. But just remember there's extra margin in there because you're directly distributing that. You're not going through a wholesaler. That's really important. Satellite winery locations. This is, in my opinion, the best way to double your gallons sold overnight. Now, it's not necessarily doubling, and I won't call you out just yet, really, but simply put, any winery or farm winery, right, J.D., in the state, can open two satellite facilities anywhere in the state, anywhere they want to. So I can, I can infringe on your market over a gallon? You market. absolutely can. We've had, people, we've had people try. I'm just kidding. We've, <laughs> had, we've had people do it, but no, you can. We in Gatlinburg could open a satellite winery in Nashville. If we wanted to. Yes, to answer that question, you can go anywhere in the market if you're a licensed winery in the state of Tennessee. Um, there's the bill source for information that details the regulations involving satellites. Information of interest, the wholesaler transfer is no longer required, so you personally can deliver it to your satellite and there's no markup. I need you to know that for most satellites, that saves them about $15,000 a year. That's a lot of money. Even if it's more than 100 miles. Yeah, this has nothing to do with the whole amount. There, yeah, there's no distance limitation except for the border of Tennessee. Can't go to Georgia, but you can stay in Tennessee. Up to three wineries can share a single satellite facility. That hasn't happened yet. But if someone wanted to, you could open a winery in Nashville and put Rick's winery in there, Jamie's winery in there, Billy's winery in there, and you could also in that one place. Winery or farm winery. Correct, winery or farm winery. That's important too. A farm winery doesn't require a federal license. It's a little bit different. If anyone has questions about that, see me or Adam or someone afterwards, but it is slightly different. We're talking about federally licensed You don't have to go through the ABC. You still have to go through the ABT, ABC. You just don't have to go through the TTB. Correct. You don't have to go through the TTB. Because with a farm winery license, you can only sell wine that's produced by another licensed winery from your fruit. 95%. 95%. So you basically grow, grow, grow the grapes, you send them to another winery, they make it into wine, send it back to you, and then you can sell it. But the taxes and cola are taken care of by the winery production, not the farm winery. Which is why you don't have to have the federal license. So there's the licensing bit, must be completed online. Wineries have opened a satellite. I may have missed a few, but Hillside Winery, Sugarland Cellars, Big Creek, Big Creek, sorry about that. Yeah. Told you, you guys can't trust me with a PowerPoint. Grinder Switch Winery, Blue Mist Farms, Paris Winery, Case Coast Cellars. There's probably a few more. Amber Falls. Amber Falls, yeah, that's right. I, that's why I asked you. I was going to add it tonight. I didn't get to it. Um, but while we're talking about it, um, 
Adam wanted me to mention Sugarland Cellars. So Sugarland Cellars opened a satellite in the same town. We had one at one end of town in Gatlinburg and one in the middle. We called this one Sugarland Cellars. We called this one Sugarland Cellars. It was a bad idea. Don't know why we did it, but we did that. So we found that what was happening is customers weren't buying from both, even though we had different wines in each because they thought it was the exact same stuff. We rebranded the satellite to be Little Bear Winery. And Little Bear Winery has all new labels, all new brand, new formulas, new colas, new labels. It's still a satellite for Sugarland, but we have an approved DBA and trade name and all that stuff for federal and state. And when we did that, 45% increase in sales because they were so close to each other. So be thinking about that. Your satellite does not have to be your brand. If, if you guys were on to go to open a satellite, it does not have to be Highland Manor. It can be whatever you want it to be as long as you get the uh, trade names and brands approved appropriately through the state and the federal license. So it's a good thing to consider. It really worked out for us, at least. I mean, if you're going to change the name, you might as well just open six. Six? Yeah. You can only do two. <laughs> you, you can do two satellites under one name. Correct, under one license. You can do two satellites under one name. You can, so you can open Big license. Creek Winer, then I can call it no, Big no, Creek. No, 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 it's per license. So your so Sugarland's you license? license. Well, you could. Well, yeah, so let's say, Don, let's say that we have Sugarland's and we have Mountain Valley. Both of them can open two satellites. Yeah, exactly. But you can't keep changing the brands and have multiple satellites just with one license. You can only do two. So it's a good question. The wholesaler being out of it was an initiative pushed by TFW last year, right? And so that, that's a substantial savings, and that should, that was one of the things preventing people from uh, getting into the, uh, the bit. So, so is the satellite a bonded location or do you pay taxes and potentially wiring to the satellite? You pay taxes when it transfers from the winery to the satellite. So yeah, because bonded right, there's no bonded premise on the satellite facility, it's all retail. All retail space. Good question. Very good question. Yeah, you don't produce there. Satellites work if they're not produced. Thank you. Very well. This is my last about my last slide, so I'm good. All right. Additional revenue streams to consider. VIP shuttle experiences. I wish Northfield was here. He's the one that got me into this idea. Northfield Vineyards does a shuttle bus where he takes people around. He goes to restaurants. He goes to his winery. He takes them by a brewery. Some other places he charges money for it. People eat that up. Um, the VIP shuttle experience that we do for the Rocky Top Wine Trail has gone over really well. We're breaking even right now. We charge $55 a ticket. And all we do is drive you to three of the wineries on the wine trail. And you get a few extra samples and some other things too. But that's an additional revenue stream you need to think about because getting that 150 people is the most important thing. If you offer people an experience, they'll do it. Food and wine events, the Herman Wine Trail, and that's in Missouri, right? Okay, good, thank you. Uh, the Herman Wine Trail has a brilliant concept of ticketed food and wine events for wine trails that should be mirrored in this state. We started trying them on the Rocket Top Wine Trail. We're nowhere near their number. I mean, they're doing thousands of people at their events. We're doing hundreds. But the fact of the matter is, what you do is you do a food and wine pairing at every property on the wine trail. Customers pay for that. They drive themselves around. They taste. Um, first time we did it was for the breakfast wine trail. We had 130 people come through all three properties. It generated $8,000 of additional revenue that day just by getting those extra people to come through, not including the tickets sold. That was just increased sales. They also bought the tickets to do the uh, food and wine event as well. Wedding event and venue, Pleasant Hill Winery, Blue Slip in Knoxville, uh, Spout Spring Estates, I know they're not here, but weddings, you can make a lot of money if you have a, a winery on the farm and you've got the venue, you've got the look and feel. Tennessee is one of the largest states for uh, weddings. Uh, Gatlinburg's number one in the, number two in the nation, only behind Las Vegas. But the whole state, is really big on weddings. People come here to get married. You can make a lot of money off of that. I don't know exact numbers, but I know an average, you can charge $4,000 for a 100 person wedding or more. Adam said, well, that's Nashville. Nashville, you can charge whatever you want. But other places, four or $5,000, no one bats an eye on a 100 person wedding for $5,000. And all you're doing is renting your venue space. You're not managing the wedding. You're not dealing with the bride or anything else. <laughs> that's why you have a vendor list and you say, Thank you for renting my space. Here are the people you can use. Call them if you need anything. Then you leave it alone. But you can make a lot of money. <laughs> it could be, Judy. Could be. It's not though. No, you, there, there is a lot of there's a lot of work to any of these things. But there are ways and opportunities of increasing your volume of wine sold. Last but not least, I believe Chamber of Commerce, Several Chamber Business After Hours. You mentioned chambers and uh, area businesses. 
It's just a huge way to get locals to know about you. It's an excellent way because the, it's a lot of your chambers will promote and market to tourists coming to the area, people visiting. Um, our Sevierville Chamber of Commerce does a business after hours, and we did one at Hillside Winery when I first started 10 years ago. We had 80 people come out and generated about $3,000 worth of sales because none of them had ever been to the winery. And they'd lived there their whole lives. So getting engaged with your chamber destinations is another way to bring those extra people in. So this is how you get those 150 people and then something more. So where's the draw on food? Because like in the city I'm in, they're, they're interested in wanting me to be a more of a restaurant or a limited service restaurant. If I do meat and cheese or something like that, so many of you guys do pizza, I wonder if you have like a separate restaurant license or is that considered part of the, part of the As a winery, you can do limited service food on site, but now if you get into full full restauranteering, you, you need to probably there, look at it. But. Is pizza to bar? You, you guys didn't have to get a separate license for the pizza, did you, Donna? No, we do all the inspections for the kitchen. So. Right, you still want to get the kitchen certified. You right. still want to get all the certifications, but you don't have to get so a separate restaurant license. In general, or is that like in general? But no, it's, a, it's, a, it's above and beyond for food. Yeah, there's additional uh, testing and uh, that you can get done to prove that you're a clean and certified kitchen to be able to process food for human consumption. Local health inspection versus partner by yeah, local health inspection by the local local health inspector rather than the Department of Agriculture inspection, which is for a winery. They're different. Yeah. yeah. A good local question. Local person still works through the state, but mm -hmm. it's different. Yeah, the, we're we're technically regulated by the Department of Agriculture. Hello, Debbie. By the Department of Ag, so they uh, they uh, come in and inspect us. But if you're a restaurant, you want to make sure that you're prepared for a local inspector as well. Um, real quick, resources weddingwire.com. If you go to do weddings, you need to put me on there because you can sell a lot of weddings that way. Um, Eventbrite.com, we sell all of our food and wine events and Rocky Top Wine Trail Shuttle, all that stuff uh, through Eventbrite because we don't have to touch it. And it uh, works really well because they remarket it for us. Half of our tickets sold, sold are sold because Eventbrite promoted it, not because we did it. We didn't pay for that. And if I've got the second, can we click video on Rocky Top, the video for the shuttle? Just to show that. Uh, top, this one, up, down. down. Yeah, that one, yep. See if it'll take us to the to the link. It might not. Let me give me a second. But just to show you guys a quick video that we came up with for the uh, VIP shuttle, and it's interesting. We're running it on Facebook, and uh, I don't know what the standard industry average is, but we're exceeding that by a lot. We had in one weekend, we had five thousand people see the video, and three thousand of them watched it all the way through. Finger so break. Normally